Today you will not surprise anyone with a miniskirt and a tiny swimsuit made of several pieces of fabric. Women wear miniskirts on the street and in the office. And a bikini, covering only the most intimate parts of the body, can be freely worn on the beach without the risk of being misunderstood. It's hard to imagine, but some 60 years ago, skirts above the knee, not to mention bikinis, were strictly banned. Women wearing such minis could paralyze street traffic, and girls in pervy swimsuits were fined and not allowed on the beaches. The freedom to wear what you like and what would not retrain your movements came along with the sexual revolution and the heyday of the feminist movement in the United States and Europe. Mini and bikini made their way through the wardrobes of the loose women of fashion. And having appeared there once, they remained forever. During their history, these garments survived several rounds of popularity and managed to turn from a symbol of women's freedom into an instrument of sexual exploitation. They stepped far beyond dressing rooms and played an important role in social life, politics, and even the economies of many countries. The story of the miniskirt, which is formally considered any skirt from the middle of the hip and above, originates in the ancient world. Of course, in most cultures of antiquity and the Middle Ages, it was not an item of everyday clothing, such a skirt was worn exclusively by dancers or circuses. Until the beginning of the 20th century, social standards obliged women to completely hide their feet from prying eyes. Ladies wore dresses and skirts to ankles, until the circumstances of force major intervened in the situation, World War I. Women actively took part in hostilities and worked on the fronts of the World War II. Therefore, wartime realities demanded that society reconsider the standards for the permissible length of a woman's dress in the direction of greater convenience and freedom of movement, skirts just below the knee came into use. Moreover, with the end of the war, the length of the hem again fell to the middle of the lower leg, where a return to pre-war standards seemed impossible. When the Second World War erupted, the hem of the skirts again jumped to the knees, which was associated not only with convenience, but also with the prosaic need to save fabric, the heavy wartime standard prescribed spending a severely limited amount of material on a female uniform. In the post-war years, female fashion was nostalgic in nature and was emphasized as feminine, men who returned from war were met by brides and wives in skirts of modest length to the middle of the lower leg. At this time, you could only see women in a skirt above the knee on the movie screen, in science fiction films like, Forbidden Planet, 1956, where actress Anne Francis could be seen in an extra short skirt. Such freedom could be forgiven if it was within the invented story about someone else's planet, leave those fantasts visionless alone. However, all other mortals living on Earth could not even imagine a woman going out in such a way. Nevertheless, in the heads of progressive designers and daring youth, this idea has already taken root. In 1955, English designer Mary Quant, along with her future husband, opened a bizarre fashion boutique in the Chelsea area of London. It is Mary Quant who is considered the founder of the modern miniskirt, and swinging London was its her historical homeland. Quant was the first among the fashion designers to add dresses with a short pleated skirt, mini cardigan dresses and other models with skirts above the knee to its collections. And they were called according to the length, Lolita, Schoolgirl, Good Girl, these models get fantastic demand among customers, and the Quant store becomes so successful that in 1963, an article about it is published in Vogue, the cult fashion magazine. Of course, the idea of raising skirts above the knee did not come from nowhere. It's been in the air of London in the late 1950s even before the Quant models. As the designer herself said many years later, it was not me who invented the miniskirt, it was invented by girls on the streets of the city. It was the daring street fashion that inspired the fashion designer to create models that young people could afford to wear. The mood in English society at that time was sharply different from the post-war. The horrors and hunger of World War II replaced the well-being of the late 50s. The economy was actively developing, people had more money and a desire to spend it. Meanwhile, a certain number of young people developed, a young rebellious generation of baby boomers. They had enough ambition, courage and money. And moreover, they preached a new morality, which, according to them, was sharply different from the hypocrite attitudes of the past. The flywheel of the sexual revolution and feminism unfolded. In this way, the appearance of a miniskirt, a symbol of freedom and sexual liberation, was not just a coincidence, but rather a logical consequence of the social shifts taking place in the world. France also had its own father of miniskirts, fashion designer André Carrege. He included a miniskirt in his collection back in 1961. The French adhere to the version that Carrege 
was the first to come up with it, and the British, of course, cheer for Quant. In any case, the latter was the first to commercialize the idea of miniskirts. The new style in clothing was called London. London was shocked by Mary Quant collection, and the British newspaper Sunday Times came out with a scandalous cover, which had a girl in a miniskirt. In 1965, the designer showed his outfits in the United States. After the show, models in miniskirts went straight onto Broadway, their walk paralyzed street traffic and was broadcast on all American channels. And their appearance the English model Jean Shrimpton in a skirt above the knee and without stockings at the horse race in Melbourne caused a sensation. In 1966, a new fashion trend even affected the British royal family. The skirts and dresses of Queen Elizabeth II became noticeably shorter, and Mary Quant received from Her Majesty the Order of the British Empire for the development of exports of light industry goods. In the USA, miniskirts entered the everyday life slower than in Europe. However, the last concerns were allayed when, in 1968, America's favorite, the impeccable Lady Jacqueline Kennedy, the widow of President John Kennedy, wore a mini dress for her wedding to Greek tycoon Aristotle Onassis. Around the world, the attitude towards miniskirts at the state level has become an indicator of the freedom of thought and freedom of women in each particular country. In such a way, in Iran, short skirts were universally allowed and were popular with local women before the Islamic Revolution of 1979. However, after the revolution, they fell under a strict ban, where they remain to this day. New fashion has shaped the demand for a new type of beauty. The magnificent feminine forms of the Marilyn Monroe era gave way to teenage silhouettes of models with long legs and a thin waist. A typical example is the legendary English supermodel Twiggy, whose pseudonym means, read, Twig. With a height of 167 centimeters, she weighed around 43 kilograms. Trying to be like Twiggy, girls around the world frantically lost weight, cut short and put on eyelashes like there's no tomorrow. In 1966, the supermodel was recognized as the face of the year, according to the British tabloid Daily Express. By the 1970s, mini fashion had slightly fell of wind. Nostalgic sentiments returned to the wardrobe recently rejected, Longuet and Maxi. In addition, feminists of the 70s, unlike their predecessors, saw in miniskirts a symbol of lenses and sexual exploitation. During this period, the punk movement became the ambassador of miniskirts. Punks, brewed with leather skirts in the famous sex store Vivienne Westwood, wore them with fishnet body stockings. By the way, it was miniskirts that spun the global market for nylon stockings, which took the place of stockings with ties on the waist. Wearing old-fashioned stockings was now inconvenient, and manufacturers urgently had to bend over backwards to meet high demand. In the 1980s, miniskirts entered business life and became a familiar element of a beautiful and confident woman's business costume. Now women in mini could be found not only at parties, but also in offices. And a decade later, interest in short skirts was fueled by the cult film Pretty Woman, where the heroine Julia Roberts showed off in ultra minis and jack boots. Perhaps, since then, short skirts have stably remained in fashion, being a mandatory part of the wardrobe of women who are not shy about showing their feet. However, in the wake of the body positive movement, even a solid splendor of forms is not a reason to deny yourself the pleasure of wearing a miniskirt. If harmless skirts at the beginning of their history faced shock and public condemnation, it is easy to imagine what resistance much more frank clothes met, three pieces of fabric called a bikini. This swimming suit, named after the Pacific Atomic Bomb Test Site, fully justified its name, and it literally had an effect of atomic explosion when in 1946 the French fashion designer Louis Reard first presented it to the public. There were several natural historical prerequisites for the appearance of bikinis. One of them is that at the beginning of the 20th century, the attitude towards swimming and beach rest in general changed dramatically. Until that time, the key reason why people went to the beach was directly for water treatments, and not tanning and joint leisure. Until the 18th century, women took baths in fenced baths, and there was no need for a swimming suit in general. Then, when joint bathing came into fashion, voluminous suits with sleeves, lush skirts, stockings and baggy pants appeared. Swimming in such outfits was inconvenient, but socially acceptable. In the 1900s, swimming outfits became more concise and simpler, but sleeves, skirt to the middle of the hip and baggy pants were still considered mandatory elements. The first to break these rules the Australian swimmer Annette Kellerman in 1907, who went to the beach of Boston in a relieving swimsuit, for which she was taken under arrest right at the crime scene. It was the first signs of change. And already in 1912, designer Carl Janssen developed form-fitting silk one-piece swimsuits for the participants of the Olympic Games in Stockholm. 
Swimming was included in the Olympic program, and the organizers of the Games were forced to turn a blind eye to the previous rules of decency in favor of greater convenience and freedom of movement. In the 1930s, the first two-piece swimming suit appeared. Cotton and silk were replaced with latex and nylon, which were less pervious to water and more comfortable in the sock. And even though the division of the one-piece swimsuit into two parts was a significant step forward, this beach outfit still covered a significant part of the body. The body of such a suit completely hid the chest, while the lower part, which looked more like shorts, rose significantly above the belly line. If England is officially considered the birthplace of the miniskirt, then a revolution called the bikini was staged in France. It was France that became the legislator of beach fashion, perhaps thanks to the chic Côte d'Azur, where rich, famous and not burdened with excessive modesty fashionistas, both men and women, rested. In May 1946, the owner of a beach clothing store located in Cannes, Jack Aime, developed a two-piece swimming suit for the new season called Atom. The essence of the name is clear, this swimming suit covered much less body than was customary at that time. The slogan of the new model shocked the public, the smallest swimming suit in the world. However, he did not stay the smallest for long. Already in July of the same year, another French designer, Louis Reard, brought an even more radical outfit to the public. Reard was inspired by the phenomenon he noticed on the beaches of the Côte d'Azur, the girls would tuck in their swimming suits for the best tan. The fashion designer called the invention Bikini, in honor of the atoll of the same name in the Pacific Ocean, where tests of the atomic bomb took place four days before the presentation of the swimsuit. The swimming suit consisted of three pieces of fabric, two triangles covered the chest, and the buttocks and groin were covered with another small fragment of tissue. It was a scandal, comparable to an atomic explosion, only in the fashion world. Bikini is small and devastating just like an atomic bomb, said Louis Reard. Not a single professional fashion designer agreed to demonstrate a pervy swimsuit in public. Therefore, the first model to appear in a bikini was 19-year-old Michelin Bernardini, a performer of erotic dances, Casino de Paris. Criticism of the media was brought down on Louis Rira. The most scandalous detail of the new outfit, from the point of view of critics, was an open belly. However, such a test has accomplished a goal, in the wake of popularity, the fashion designer received 50,000 bikini orders. Bikini still remained a product, the demand for which was dictated by changes in society of that time. From the indicator of poverty and hard work, tanning became a companion of a relaxed and rich life, and women's fashion began to move towards greater freedom of morals. Wearing bikinis on public beaches was banned in Italy, Spain, Portugal, Australia and in some US states. Girls in bikinis were not allowed into country clubs and hotels, they were fined by the sea and near pools. Pope Pius XII called the bikini a sinful suit unworthy of Catholics, and in 1951, after rewarding the first winner of the Miss World contest in a swimsuit, countries with a strong religious lobby promised to boycott the contest if such shame happens again. The only place where the new minimalist swimsuit was accepted and was never banned, the Côte d'Azur of France. In 1952, the film Manina, a girl in a bikini, was released, which documented a new word in the minds of the world community. The main role starred the young sex bomb of that time Brigitte Bardot. And already at the Cannes Festival of the same year, Bardot, creating additional advertising for the film, was boldly photographed for the press in a bikini on the beach of the Côte d'Azur. In most US states, bikinis officially remained banned. However, it did not prevent Hollywood actresses from actively taking pictures in tiny swimsuits, fueling interest in themselves and forming the role of sex symbols. Marilyn Monroe, Rita Hayworth, Anita Ekberg and other Hollywood beauties posed in the bikini. Needless to say that their photos in swimsuits instantly reached the world and to the covers of magazines, and formed the image of a progressive independent girl who was not shy about her own sexuality. And when the first James Bond film Dr. No was released in 1962, where the first Bond girl performed by Ursula Andress appeared coming out from the sea in a white bikini. Now, the resistance was finally broken. It's been bald 60s, the heyday of the sexual revolution. Against the background of these dramatic changes, the bikini finally regained the status of the beach mainstream. In 1964, an even more provocative swimsuit appeared, Monokini. It was a swimming suit without a top, completely exposing the chest. The designer of this outfit, the convinced nudist Rudy Gernreich, predicted that the chest in public places would begin to be exposed in the next five years, but this never happened massively. Monokini did not take root and remained in history as a bold fashion experiment, as well as the radical swimsuit model out, which completely opened the pubic zone. The 1970s brought new elements and materials to bikinis, hook knitting, fringe, skin, PVC. 
and by 1990, the first mini bikinis appeared on sale, tiny pieces of fabric covering only nipples and intimate areas in the lower part of the body. Today, a wide range of swimming suits are available to women from secular countries, from maxi options covering a significant part of the body to minimalistic patches on thin straps. The story of the conquest of the fashion world by miniskirts and bikinis shows that new developments in the wardrobe were directly related to social and political changes in society. Short skirts and tiny swimwear went from a symbol of liberation and freedom to a symbol of sexual lenses, and eventually became mainstream and just another everyday clothing option. Women finally had the right to wear what corresponded to their beliefs, figure and mood, without looking back at stereotypes, prohibitions and the opinions of others.